It's a real pleasure this afternoon to have with us Tim Johnson. He's Director Aviation Environment Federation and he's the lead, lead observer at ICAO for ICSA. And we have Andrew Murphy, who's Aviation Lead at Transport and the Environment. I'm going to hand over in a second to Paul Peters and to Chris Lyle, who are going to conduct the interview. And I'll come back at the end to thank everybody for their participation. I'm certainly looking forward to hearing what everyone's got to say. So, Chris, over to you. Thank you, Harold. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open by a sort of general question and uh, an up-to-date one that um, both the Aviation Environment Federation and Transport Environment have expressed concern at the recent change by the KO Council to the Corsia baseline in response to the impact of COVID-19. And I noticed that the Economist newspaper picked this up and called it a carbon neutral industry has defanged an already mostly toothless scheme. Would your organizations continue to support Corsia? And to what extent do you feel new aviation emissions mitigation options should be explored? So perhaps I could ask Tim and then um, Andrew to comment. Well, I, mean, I think there was always the case that we were going to need additional measures to, to Corsia, uh, even before the, the baseline change. Um, given the fact that the Corsia scheme aims to keep international aviation emissions uh, at sort of 2020 levels on a, on a net basis, we found that as a target uh, falls a long way short of what we want to achieve for the sector in terms of putting it on a pathway towards a, a, a Paris sort of temperature goal. And for that reason, I think additional measures were always needed. So the, the decision by council recently hasn't changed that fact. What it has done, of course, is to remove any form of carbon pricing uh, on, on international aviation, with the exception of the EU ETS, probably for, for several years to come. And I think that's actually going to inhibit uh, and in delay other actions that that carbon price may have spurred. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, very similar um, response to Tim. It's been a few years since Tini has actively supported Corsia. I think what we've learned in the last few years um, is that Corsia as it's designed is going to do very little um, to incentivize airlines to burn less, less fossil fuel. And we know the urgency of climate change to advance measures will immediately reduce them. I think what, what COVID and the change to Corsia baseline have done has it's highlighted what ICAO's um, priority is. The priority is protecting um, the growth and the profitability of the aviation industry um, over effective measures to cut emissions in the sector. And I think that's quite useful for the public and regulators around the world to know where ICAO's priorities lie. Uh, so we've been saying to governments here in Europe that now up to them to take sort of uh, measures needed to cut emissions from aviation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and I mean, the concern I've had is that uh, I, I personally can't see China, India, or Russia ever joining it, um, and that, that 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 is pretty important. But um, Tim, you mentioned the the the, the pricing aspect, um, and the only place we do have it now is, is the European ETS. Would you uh, actually continue to support the concept of offsetting at all, uh, aside from the ICAO um, Corsia situation? Um, so we certainly do not see it as a long-term solution. And um, I think it's very clear that as you get towards 2050, as the world gets towards 2050 uh, and, and a net zero goal, I mean, there just won't be offsets available on the scale required to, to, to fund the aviation industry, certainly of, of, of sufficiently high quality. Um, and, and for that reason, uh, amongst many others, um, I think you know, we certainly do not see it playing a role uh, in the long-term decarbonisation pathway. I think what's a more important question is how quickly we transition from offsetting scheme, which is, which is already in place, how, however weak that may now be, um, to insector reductions. Uh, and I suppose the fear is that because Corsia will last until 2035, and given the cost of many of the alternatives uh, for making insector reductions, that is actually going to delay action and the airlines, especially in the sort of post-COVID 
extremely cost conscious uh, environment, you know, they'll be prioritizing how they can meet environmental obligations at the least possible cost. And that, that suggests that, that they will prefer to use offsetting rather than perhaps making the necessary investments in, in, in some of the technology and, and fleet renewals that we'd like to see. Yeah, you mentioned the need for in-sector activity. Um, do you see ICAO continuing to have a major role in that? I mean, they do have a, a, an emission standard now, a CO2 emission standard for aircraft, so it's not exactly um, pushing the line. Um, or, or would you see, you know, individual industries and manufacturers and countries doing their own thing? So I think we've always viewed ICAO as perhaps, you know, the sort of level playing field that unites everyone. But I think when it comes to pushing the boundaries, whether that's technologies or, or whether that's sort of operational efficiency measures, um, it's really going to fall to industry, I think, and to, to governments to, to set the required pace. So I think it's very much going in, in that direction. Okay, and, and I, I know in, in the UK, you've got the Climate Change Committee saying that uh, you need, they need to put international aviation into um, the national carbon budget uh, as well, which um, hopefully will uh, lead, lead to more forceful activity. Andrew, sorry, let's pick up with what you would have to say on, on uh, offsets um, moving forward to in-sector activity. Yeah. Um... Look, offsets are now an idea that's been a few decades old, and we know they continue to be uh, re repeated with difficulties, making them deliver the emission effects they promise. We do have a climate emergency. Several governments, including uh, the UK Parliament, have believed declared a climate emergency. And in the context of a climate emergency, where all sectors have to immediately begin reducing their emissions, it's difficult to see really what role offsetting can play. And also, you know, why we should expend our energies on trying to fix offsetting and improve offsetting. You know, we really have to zero in on the policies that will make an immediate impact. And, you know, that's about blocking airport expansion, that's about investing in new fuels, that's about, that's about pricing aviation more effectively. You know, I've been in for the last few years in these meetings on Corsia with some really um, talented, influential people who have spent several years trying to make Corsia into an effective um, offsetting scheme. From our perspective, that's perhaps a poor use of, of human talents and, and finance. And really, we should have been putting our energies into measures which could be far more effective. Yeah, that, that, okay, thank you. But, well, this, this can help me turn us to looking at what is happening in, on the technology front. I mean, AEF has succeeded to the UK Jet Zero Council. And Tim, you participated in the launch by your namesake, Prime Minister. I hope he's no relation, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, congratulations on that. Um, and the, the push seems to be by the Aerospace Technology Institute, which last week launched something called Fly Zero. And there are similar concepts going on in France and Germany. To what extent do either of you feel that NGOs can play a role in these, um, the, the, these bodies and, 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 and an influencing role? And do you believe that the tourism community, the, what we're trying to do, Paul, Harold and myself at the moment, um, to bring in support from the Tourism Committee, would that help? Tim? So, so I think on, on the Jet Zero Council, I mean, we were, we were pleased to be involved and the UK government, you know, in previous years has always set its sights on, on the UK being a sort of uh, world-beating aerospace sector and having a world-beating aviation industry. And we said, well, why not extend that ambition to, to environmental protection as well? Why not, why not take the lead in trying to decarbonize the sector? So in a sense, we see the formation of the Jet Zero Council as a response to that. Um, to what extent can, can we have influence? I'd like to think that one of the issues that the council has identified is that you can't just develop technology without having a, a regulatory and policy framework behind it. Um, because, you know, if we succeed in producing, you know, what was the stated goal of transatlantic zero carbon flight within a generation, you know, that's one plane. And actually the goal, you know, we're, we're working towards is a whole net zero sector by, by 2050, which means that you have to look 
beyond the new technology and think, well, how do you get the old technology out? How do you actually create the marketplace when the new technology or, or the fuels come along? People are going to pay the premium that will undoubtedly be associated with them initially. You have to have that, that policy uh, framework in place. And I, I, I think that's a much bigger discussion than just the, the membership of the Jet Zero Council, which it comprises largely airlines, airports and, and, and the manufacturing sectors. You know, AEF is, uh, is a, a bit of a lone voice. So I think, you know, the more um, tourism uh, and other stakeholders can, can get involved in that discussion, the more it will strengthen the, the, the fact that, you know, we actually need a, a strategy to take us from today to net zero and, and the jet zero has to fit in with that. Uh, and it has, to, it has to ensure that it has the right market incentives for uptake, but it's not always entirely dependent on government handouts uh, and grants uh, to, to get it uh, up and running and to sustain it. It has to stand on its own two feet. Yeah. Andrew, how would you see that working in the European context? I mean, uh, would it be feasible? I mean, the, the European Commission has uh, come up with a, a, a strategy and, and is working towards net zero for generally, not necessarily for aviation as yet, but what would you feel about that? I think what we're seeing a lot in, in, in Brussels in the last month in particular is more discussions around new aircraft designs and a bit of hype around hydrogen aircraft. And of course, you know, it's very easy to put together councils of experts. It's very easy to commission reports and to get very excited about potential aircraft designs which may arrive in, in five or 10 years time. Um, but as Tim said, it's not just about having these big plans with big vision, it's about the nuts and bolts of how you get from plans on paper to these aircraft actually existing, whether there is a credible path for getting them. I think to some extent there is a view amongst some uh, policymakers and amongst the public that what we need is some sort of Tesla of aviation where a company will sort of appear and solve the problem of the aviation sector. Of course, you know, Tesla has been a successful in enterprise because of car CO2 standards in China, in the US, in Europe. Tesla is a success because the Obama stimulus package included a lot of money for the um, for the solar um, battery plant in the US. So, you know, could these move on to the next step of clean aircraft? You know, we're skeptical of their ability, but if they do come about, it needs to be a much more aggressive level of convention from governments. It's not about giving small amounts of grants to some startups. Um, it's not about sort of deregulating that way to come along. It's really going to have to be a multinational program to develop and deploy this new aircraft. I mean, Concorde took two UK governments, the French and the UK. That was essentially you know, a passenger version of what was a military aircraft already. So you know, you're going to need big buy-in from multiple governments. Um, no one government can do it. No one company can do it. Perhaps if, if it's to stand any chance, it needs to span a number of actors, a number of countries, and quite a lot of money. Fly Zero launch last week. That the one of the questions was, um, are they going to work between the UK and Europe, and how, how well? And I, it wasn't a very clear, it wasn't a very clear answer of how that's now going to work in the context of Brexit. Um, could we turn to the issue that interests the three of us, uh, Harold, Harold, Paul, and myself in particular, to the question of alternative fuels rather than the long-term structural changes to, to infrastructure and, and the aircraft. Um, and in, let's start with biofuels. Um, at present, many of the biofuels for, 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 for um, feedstock for biofuels are considered appropriate for development and they, they call them sustainable. Uh, but aside from waste, they don't seem to be hold good on a full life cycle. To what extent would you uh, support the further evolution of biofuels for air transport. Uh, sorry, Tim. Um, so I, 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 sorry, Chris. Um, I'll, I'll do one, two, three. You can edit it out, and I'll start again. <laughs> 
I think the, the real the real challenge that we have with sustainable aviation fuels in terms of the biofuel component at the moment is is scaling up. So I think we can all look at various feedstocks, particularly on the on the waste side, and see that they probably have the ability to to significantly reduce emissions on a on a life cycle basis. Um, and to the extent that you no, know, they are they are wastes, then then we would be of <coughs> them coming through. But you know the infrastructure to produce them is not really there around the world. Um, even in the UK, we have planning permission that was just been granted um, last month for Velocis to open a plant on on the. Uh, on estuary, um, and of course they point to sort of 28 million tons of solid waste in the UK as the potential for, for what they're doing. Um, but it is just one plant, and you know, you know, it, if we are going to to scale up, then you know, you really need to see the investment now in multiple plants. Um, it's taken six years to get the Velocis plant uh, up and running. Um, and it will be a couple more years bef before it's operational. So, so for me, it's you know that there, there are unsustainable uh, biofuels. There are there are better biofuels, but the better biofuels need to to have the market stimulated. And um, clearly, with the the price differential, airlines are not going to buy them at the moment, uh, given given the fact they typically cost twice as much. And you know, investors have got cold feet because if airlines don't have to buy them why would investors risk their, their money in investing in the infrastructure so so, so I, I guess there's a sort of twin edge dilemma really maintaining the sustainability criteria without straying into the use of, of, of least less sustainable feedstocks but at the same time ensuring the the capacity is there to to, to utilize what you do have um, and, and I think a combination of those things mean that we're not really going to see this sector scale up significantly in the, in the coming years. I mean, there's the, the well-known, well-often quoted stat now that, you know, in 2017, I think the industry used in the region of about 7 million litres of alternative fuel, but that's equivalent to 0.002% of the global fuel need. Um, so we'd have to scale up by 500 times even to get to 1%. And I say without that infrastructure and with limited sustainable feedstocks, I think the potential to do that over the next five or 10 years is going to be quite small. So you could argue that actually, um, and I'm sure Andrew have a lot to say around this, around um, not biofuels, but, but sort of synthetic fuels, perhaps that is uh, a better direction to be heading in and we should actually be creating the infrastructure that would support that. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because of course the, the industry sells historic use of biofuels by, by saying something like 220,000 flights have taken place using biofuels, but of course in a very small, and there was the famous um, picture of, of somebody uh, sipping coconut, if you remember a, a few years ago. Uh, Andrew, what's your, what's your position on, on biofuels? I mean, we, we've had a lot of talk, much like new aircraft design, we've had a lot of talk in recent uh, years about new fuels and how new fuels will solve aviation's climate. And, you know, they haven't arrived in significant quantities. They remain more expensive. And so, you know, the question for us is, why will the next few years be different from the previous years up to now? What's going to change? I think what has changed is an understanding that these fuels aren't going to come to the market just by... Um, industry sort of stealth initiative and by the by the pluck of a few uh, few uh, rich investors and so what we're seeing from the eu is a initiative called refuel eu where the european commission is, is proposing will propose that um, for alternative fuels and aviation and that will be you know a world first in an effort to regulate the two content of fuels in a major aviation market we don't quite know what that fuel, what that proposal will contain. It has to go through legislation here in Europe. Uh, but a co public consultation was launched just a few weeks ago, and that consultation um, sort of had outlines of what the proposal will contain. Indeed, it will have a focus on synthetic kerosene, e-fuels, that alternative fuels which are produced using 
uh, renewable electricity. And you know what's really changed even in the last five years, the price of renewable electricity has essentially collapsed in many parts of the world, uh, meaning fuels produced from renewable electricity not aren't cost competitive uh, with kerosene. They're no longer as cost prohibitive as they once were. And so we, we can see a viable route to developing these fuels in a way which isn't economically destructive for aviation. We can see that it takes place over the next few, few years of mapping of production. There is a pathway to get the sector to zero emissions by 2020, um, but it will require a lot more work, and a lot more sense of urgency in government. So we hope that um, you know COVID doesn't have a distraction towards the, the necessary steps to see this field. Well, thank you, Andrew. I think uh, turning to the subject of synthetic fuels, I think now is the time for uh, Paul to come in and just talk us a little, a little bit about. Um, his position on synthetic fuels. Paul. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I will indeed say a little bit about this. Um, well, first of all, uh, if you look at biofuels, then of course it depends on the feedstock, but there is a long list of problems with them. And you have to have regulation with all those problems like, uh, well, one basic problem is that uh, biofuels on life cycle uh, terms never reach zero. At best, 80% reduction. And if you look at the, the growth perspectives, then we will need more than five times the current fuel by the end of the century. So they can at best, even with a mix of 100%, uh, provide the same emissions as today, which is, of course, not, not the right proposition. Um, Another thing with, uh, with biofuels is that the efficiency of the whole system, the energy conversion efficiency of plants is, is in the region of less than 1%. So less than 1% of the solar energy falling on a plant is um, in the end uh, produces something you can make a fuel of. While for, for a simple solar panel, that's 25%. And, and that could the, in the, the region, region of, uh, of uh, 30 to 40 percent. So, yeah, why sticking to something that's so inefficient? <laughs> um, so, therefore, the, uh, the option of uh, e-fuels is, uh, is an important one because then you directly use solar and wind energy and carbon dioxide, which is everywhere. I mean, every country has carbon dioxide in the air. So, you can produce it basically in any place where there is enough renewable energy. Um, so that's, an, uh, of course, a big advantage. But still, the problem is, uh, the only problem with, uh, with e-fuels that I see is that they are consuming quite a lot of energy. It would even more or less double the energy consumption of uh, aviation if you would have 100% e-fuels, which, for instance, means that uh, with um, uh, is the renewable energy for one flight from Amsterdam to Paris or from London uh, to Paris, you could uh, uh, do the same, uh, use the same energy to 10 times going there by train. So that's a huge difference. It's even bigger than the current difference in uh, energy use. Um, and one of the consequences of this high energy use, of course, is the cost of the, the fuel, as it is with uh, biofuels as well, but even more with uh, e-fuels. And I'd like to show you uh, a, a small graph of the future development of cost with and without e-fuels. And there are some surprising things in that. It should be here if I share the screen. Yeah, you can see the graph, I guess. Um, the orange line, this is history. So this is the historic ticket price with some bumps uh, here around some uh, crisis. Um, and we expect that slowly the price will go down still uh, if in, in a business as usual uh, scenario. In a scenario where you assume that, uh, uh, that the uh, share of e-fuels is slowly increased to something like 100% by 2060 about, um, 2075, then initially, of course, there are small shares uh, added to the, uh, the cost, so the cost will still go down, but not that much. And somewhere in 2040, you are at the current cost of tickets. Well, that is the 2019 cost. 
the current cost is not uh, not representative, I think. And then, of course, the shares go up because the, the factories start really to to uh, 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 to be built and to be producing. But you end up with something that's not much higher than in just after 2010. Uh, so this is the situation uh, regarding uh, the cost of the tickets. And by the end, of course, compared to the business as usual, one, the tickets are almost two times as expensive as they could have been in business as usual. But that, of course, ignores, for instance, that if you don't solve climate change, that maybe flying becomes more expensive because of all sorts of other uh, issues that, uh, that are the result of climate change. So this is the situation. And the question then is, could the industry cope with such a gradual increase of the cost without, for instance, collapsing or having big difficulties or, um, for instance, uh, uh, countries that are very much depending on uh, aviation-based tourism, would they run into, count, uh, into difficulties because of this? And I mean, this is already 20 years, so, and then not much happens. <laughs> so maybe for, for Andrew, um, idea about this. I will stop sharing, by the way. Um, Who yeah. would like to start? <laughs> Tim? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's not, you know, I, Paul, Paul has done some fantastic work there and outlining that there is no cheap solution to solving aviation and climate problems. Um, if there was, we may have had more success to date. Uh, and I think the fact that aviation may get more expensive, I think it raises a few, I mean, all this raises a few questions as to how much public money we should put into making aviation uh, decarbonization cheaper. Uh, how do we adjust and adapt to a world where uh, aviation is expensive? Um, but you know, we've experienced this world where aviation is more expensive. You know, this, uh, this development of low cost carriers where prices is brought artificially low due to a range of not just tax free fuel, but also for um, labor. You know, this is a recent development. Um, and it's one that's not been entirely positive for all the communities that have been involved. And that includes um, people on the ground in high tourism areas who are starting to push back. Those who have seen their um, their rights, their worker rights undermined by, by cheap emissions. Um, those other sectors of the economy, which are having to do more to reduce their emissions um, because of aviation's options act. And you know, it's a very long list, even going up to the issue of the Boeing and Airbus subsidies, which has caused a trade war between the US uh, and Europe, which is impacting uh, the wine producers in France. You know, there's a lot of ripple effects from this, this, this structure we've set up deep aviation has enormous ripple effects, which is affecting an awful lot of people. And I think if we're to say to not just in the aviation industry, but to the public as a whole, that we have a plan to reduce aviation climate impact, but over time it will gradually increase the cost of aviation. I think that would achieve a broad amount of support. And I think what it calls for is for everyone in the sector to sort of get together and acknowledge this is the this is the direction we're going to head in. These are some of the consequences. You know, how do we address them? Um, I think the most obvious one is employment. Um, but I do think there's employment opportunities in, in new fuels and development. I think we can still have a net positive impact on employment. But, you know, the most constructive thing anyone can do is if you're an aviation lobbyist, if you're working in aviation, you can try and get on board what is the only path really to decarbonize the emissions and make sure that we do this in a collective and thoughtful way. Uh, Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? You took, you mentioned the low-cost carriers, but uh, just recently, Standard last week, Standard and Poor's said said there's only three investment-grade airlines left in the world. They're all um, low-cost carriers: EasyJet, Ryanair, and Southwest. Um, and that intrigued me because, of course, you know, it, the bottom end of the market I would have thought was going to be hit harder than the top end of the market. Okay. Anyway, Tim, uh, what, would you like to respond to what uh, Paul and Andrew have said? 
Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I agree with Andrew um, that I think it's, it's inevitable that if we're going to succeed in decarbonizing, that, that there is going to be a, a, a cost increase. Um, just to go back to the previous example of, of biofuels, um, I mean, Lord Adair Turner, who's now heading up the Energy Transition Commission, but was a previous chair of the UK Committee on Climate Change. I mean, their vision is to get almost 100% biofuel use in the sector. But he says you cannot do that without a minimum $200 per tonne of carbon, um, carbon price. That's the only way you can drive it. And, and he has similar numbers, Paul, to yours. You know, he shows that adding sort of perhaps four or five hundred dollars to a, a transatlantic ticket, which would have similar, similar impacts, I think. Um, his point is that, that, you know, A, it's necessary. But secondly, it may look like a big increase if you only compare it to the cost of a, of a business as usual ticket. But if you actually look at it as a percentage of disposable income, it's perhaps more, he argues, it's more bearable uh, on society than, than the industry may fear. So that, that's one take on it. The other one is if you look at all the pathways that have been projected to get to net zero for aviation, I don't think any of them envisage achieving that without having some form of demand management. We can have technology, we can have operations, we can have you know, synthetic fuels and, and, and biofuels, but the likelihood is by 2050, we still have residual uh, emissions in this sector. So you can't escape from the fact that you, you need to, to, to look at the demand question. So if the consequence of investing in new technologies and fuels is a cost increase, that may be one of the ways in which you know, the growth in demand starts to, to dampen. So it has a, you know, it, it plays to a second policy agenda, really, uh, and perhaps a legitimate policy agenda, one that's perhaps hard for politicians to, to talk about um, as a direct uh, objective, uh, policy objective. But as an indirect consequence of investment in, in, in cleaner technologies, um, it, it does have that, have that added advantage. The carbon price is going to have to come from somewhere. Yeah. Um, should we start thinking about demand management now, or should we just be focusing on new types of aircraft, new types of fuels, and how to pay for them? Well, if you'd asked me 12 months ago, I'd have said yes. Um, but given where the industry is now, I think it's politically unrealistic that anyone's going to be talking about demand management at a time when the industry is looking to recover and bounce back from what is a very low level of activity. But I think we shouldn't miss this opportunity now to say what sort of industry do we want in the future? Um, and it's always very hard to say stop doing something and to be perceived as going backwards. But when you're growing from a much lower base, you know, you can talk about how much aviation is sustainable and, you know, the extent to which we can better align demands to the industry's ability to, to reduce emissions. So that conversation, I think, has to start now. Uh, if the measures may be applied in the future, but I think you need to have a, a clear sense of where the bite points will come um, and send those clear um, warning signals to the industry. And that in itself will, will add as a further stimulus and incentive. Andy, did you have something to add? Yeah, I mean, on, on the issue of demand management, you know, we, we've had not just COVID this year, but, but maybe last year more so, we had the issue of leak scams. And you know, individuals deciding they didn't want to travel as much as they had previously, and we saw at the same time a record number of people taking the train. And I, I think there was a belief that you know this idea of being able to get in the plane and go on city breaks, you know, have destination weddings, have several have several holidays a year. You know, this was sort of our initial reaction to low cost carriers, and to some extent, it's a slight you know, conceit on our part to think that younger generations will want to continue and travel in the same way we have. And already we were seeing some signs that actually younger generations maybe didn't want that. Maybe want to travel and experience parts of the world in a different way. We had sort of the leisure travel argument for future growth a little undermined us 
and now during COVID, you're seeing people not traveling to work and you're seeing them just bring conferences. All of a sudden, you have to realize that they don't want to travel to work and actually they don't need to work. Maybe there was a time when traveling to work had a, had a level of sort of you know, glamour or, or interest to it. But now, when you know, flying isn't quite the uh, glamorous experience it was, when you're still connected to your office anyway by phone all the time, so you're not exactly getting away from the office, you know, maybe people traveling for work isn't, isn't all that people thought it was previously. And so we're seeing two big pillars of demand and demand. And I think, I think the phrase demand management is maybe not the right um, phrase to use because it gives the impression of maybe bureaucrats or um, over-interfering NGOs sort of sitting behind a desk and, and deciding who gets to travel and who doesn't. I think it's not as, as catchy a phrase, but I think what we need is sort of realistic idea of where demand is going to go. And we shouldn't just presume that everyone's going to want to travel more and more to more and more places. Um, and, you know, we need to kind of design a aviation policy and industrial policy, employment uh, policies around the possibility that actually organic people will decide that the quality of life is, is better enhanced by flying less. And I think it's difficult for them, some of those who are decision makers to accept that, to love to fly, and to you know, have built big plans around bigger airports to accept that actually maybe flying frequently is popular, won't be popular in the future, and we should plan accordingly. That's a really excellent point, Andrew. I mean, what we were seeing prior to COVID, as, as Andrew said, is a sort of a more climate conscious public in general. Uh, and, and also a more climate conscious consumer. And, you know, there were signs that, that demand was beginning to, to level off in, 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 in parts of Europe. And the question was going to be, you know, to what extent would that be sustained throughout the rest of the year uh, and, and, and maybe globally? And I don't know if you, if you ask the average person, and in fact, many, many surveys have backed this up, People are aware that aviation contributes to climate change. What they're less aware of is the extent to which a flight can dominate their own personal carbon footprint. So what does taking that flight, um, either intra-European or, or long haul, what does, what does that flight mean in terms of the, the carbon associated with all their activities in a, in a given year? And, and, and as people begin to understand the, the intensity of flying, I, I, I think that will inform a different sort of consumer. And I think it leads us on to the question that it is still extremely difficult for the consumer when you book a flight to find out what the carbon is associated with that flight. You may, after you've made the booking, be invited to offset your emissions. But when you're at the booking point, there is no information between carriers. Um, you can look up numerous carbon calculators that would give you emissions per route, uh, but it treats all carriers the same. But getting carrier specific information um, isn't really uh, easy. And, and I think that has to change, you know, in every other um, sort of form of, uh, of activity, whether it's buying sort of, you know, fridges, freezers, washing machines, choosing a car, you have that information up front. It's part of your purchasing decision. It isn't in aviation. And, and I think that that has to change. And not only will you get people perhaps choosing not to fly, but you'll get people choosing their flight based increasingly on, 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 on climate considerations. Um, and I think that that consumer pressure is something new that the industry won't have faced. Regulatory pressure, yes. Market incentives, yes. But not really consumer pressure. Um, and I think that 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 will that that will come probably sooner than, than many in the industry are ready for. Yeah, the carbon labeling is pretty important. In fact, there are two uh, that I'm aware of two, two, two bodies that are doing this. One is Travelist, and the other is YSP. And the wise key in particular is quite well advanced, but it includes much more than the carbon footprint. It includes several other things, but of course it hasn't got off the ground yet. It's got to get much uh, to get publicity. But if I can get back to e-fuels again, we seem to have strayed a little bit, but that doesn't matter. It's a good conversation. Um, and and the, the costing of, of e-fuels and who should be paying for this? Should it be governments? Should it be the shippers? Should it be the travellers? the airlines, it should, should be 
all of them. And um, also at the same time, you know, we are in a situation whereby there is still no, no uh, fuel taxes on international aviation, um, though it could be allocated to individual countries quite well. And it's perhaps something that they might like to think about for COP26. But um, do you think, well, I, I'm sure you do think that the taxes should be put in or back on, on international aviation too, or not back, but on avi international aviation. And, um, but what if this is hypothecated towards, for example, the costing and development of e-fuels? Uh, Andrew, what do you think? I think, you know, let's, before we get into answering your question directly, you know, you, you've raised the, the question of the cost of all this. And I think we, do, we should take a pause at the moment and, and just look at the cost of the current model we have. We're here in Europe. What we do each year is we spend billions of euro basically in importing fossil fuels from outside of Europe. So that's money out of the European economy. We then bring these, these this kerosene into Europe. We then burn it in the sky, which warms up the planet, uh, has negative negative environmental benefits to people in Europe and also people world, worldwide. The current model we have, and also the benefit of a small number of people who do most of the buying. You know, um, 15% of people in the UK are responsible for 10 percent Right. So we have this enormously, enormously expensive, damaging uh, model, which really actually benefits quite a small number of people. And so, you know, it's very easy to kind of look at the price of eat people and go, well, you know, gosh, this is all very expensive. But actually, we're trying to get away from, from a model which is in its own way quite, quite expensive and quite destructive. If you move to a model which involves e-fuels, okay, you're paying more for the fuel. What's happening with that money? You know, that, that money you, you pay for the e-fuels isn't going into a pit and being set on fire. The money going into e-fuels is being used to install the renewable electricity to make those fuels, the refineries to produce them, the research to try and cost them. You know, all of this is employing people. All of this is staying within the European economy if you produce the people in Europe. Um, you know, this, this is a positive uh, impact both for society and for the European economy, and you shouldn't get away from that. Now, to actually answer your question, that's who pays for it. Well, you know, the same as who pays for anything. You're the one who's, who's getting that flight, and, and this is the cost of that flight to be decarbonized. Well, you know, the person who pays this um, to be the person who pays that flight. Now, that's an easy answer, I guess, from an NGO perspective, but we do need a lot of upfront investment uh, in these fuels. Uh, get them off the ground. I mean, the best way to get that money uh, is to better tax aviation and, and put some of that money into the fuel. Thank you, Andrew. Tim? Yeah, very similar, actually. I, I, I think that um, it is important, I think, to, to show um, that some of these things are not only feasible, but, but can be scaled. And though there is a role for the government incentive in in in, in doing that, but um, ultimately that that has to be balanced by the amount of taxation uh, the industry is paying. So I think we would be very supportive of, of more taxation on the aviation sector uh, that would support some of that hypothecation. But longer term, that's a, that's about getting the infrastructure in place. I mean, once you've got the infrastructure in place and you are producing the fuels, it, it becomes an operating cost. And I, and I think that has to be borne by the airlines and ultimately it has to be borne by, by the consumer through ticket prices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm wondering, one, one of the things that's happening as, as I see it from a distance on, on, on the COVID process is that the tourism sector, uh, a lot of the tourism sector is now looking at developing a new tourism model. They're saying we are getting insufficient retained uh, revenue in our countries. We've had over tourism. We've got to now start rethinking our tourism model and, and uh, having a, you know, a, a better um, way of, of producing our, our, our revenues without upsetting local life too much. So the tourism sector is, is, seems to be doing this the aviation sector is not and the aviation sector totally seems to me focused on getting back to as close to business as usual 
uh, as it can of possible talk of, of um, the hub and spoke system being amended slightly. Um, now, do you think that the aviation sector should get on with concerted action and particularly focus on fuel technologies and measures that are effective rather than doing it on a, a bit by bit basis? And if so, uh, who would do this? Uh, you, you've got ICAO, which is protect and promote the industry. You've got IATA, which is protect and promote the industry. Um, what, are you, what are your views on this? I'd, I'd approach the problem in a slightly different way um, and say, you know, there are lots of ways in which it can be done, whether it's industry partnerships with, with governments or at ICAO, ICAO level. But first of all, you have to create the accountability. Um, and one of the recommendations from the UK Committee on Climate Change is that we should be including emissions from international aviation in our Climate Change Act. And that would hold not just this government, but successive governments between now and 2050 accountable for those emissions and would give them, um, if you like, responsibility for ensuring that on an economy wide basis, including international aviation, we hit net zero by 2050. And I think if you can get that framework right, you avoid the sort of, you know, political spikes of interest. And the industry spikes of interest. I mean, I think if you look back over 20 years, we've seen the waves of industry interest. You know, in the run up to the Copenhagen COP, where it thought, where most people thought there would be the beginnings of an international, new international agreement to replace Kyoto. You know, the industry felt the pressure and it wanted to maintain its sort of leadership role and keep it out of UNFCCC uh, and kept it regulated more as a, as a sector. And you know, they stepped up their efforts. And that was one of the reasons why IKEA was able to adopt a climate goal in 2012. And then in the run up to Paris, we had the same spike of enthusiasm again to, to be seen to be doing something, to be seen to have the answers, both at IKEA and industry level. And that sort of gave rise to Corsia. But we can't afford to have the troughs in between. So I think unless you actually have the continuous accountability uh, and ideally, in the UK context, it would be legally enforceable to hold governments to this. Um, you're not going to create the continuous uh, rationale for, for improvement that we need. Because if you have that, you hold up all your policies and, and measures and you can benchmark it and you can track it and you know if you're on course and you need to do more. Uh, that, to me, is what needs to happen. We, 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 it's, it's not so much about advocating for industry to go off and do this or for a particular government or groups of governments to go off and do it, although I, I think that's probably going to be necessary. It's, it's about making sure that ultimately someone is accountable and, and this will happen. That, that has to be, I think, the, the next important step. Yeah, well, there are a few countries, notably in Europe, who, who are going the same route as UK and including aviation in, in their targets. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a global trend towards that. And it would obviously help if the UNFCCC at COP26 uh, said that international aviation should be included in the nationally determined contributions of states. Um, so I would hope that is, is, is a route to go. Do you, think, do you think that would be helpful? I presume you'd agree with that. James. Yeah, I think it would be helpful, but it, I think people present this argument that it's ICAO or UNFCCC, and I don't see it. I, I see them both I, as being complementary. That just because countries have nationally determined contributions to that will reduce emissions that include international aviation, it doesn't preclude ICAO for, from being a forum where some level of international measure is introduced. Um, but what it does allow for is where countries want to be more ambitious, they can be so. So I, I actually see them not as a choice between one or the other. But I don't, I, I don't think advocating for, for COP to include them in NDCs in any way undermines the role for ICAO. I think, I think the two are, 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 are capable of working together. Uh, one creates the ambition, the other one perhaps focuses more on, okay, so how, how do we do this? Except, except that 
the, the resolution which establishes the KO says there shall be no other body, no other market-based measure in the world, uh, which is a bit awkward. Anyway, uh, sorry, Andrew, let's bring you in here for your comments on this. Well, I, you know, I've, I've been working in aviation emissions now for six years. And, you know, whatever conference I go to, one of the most frequent phrases I hear is that um, aviation is an international sector, therefore needs international solutions. Uh, and it was a ridiculous point to begin with. Um, you know, Volkswagen is a, a car company in Europe which exports at 180. But no one says that have UN CO2 standards for cars went ahead and did it. So it was nonsense even before COVID. But I think it's, it's nonsense even after COVID because what we saw when the crisis struck was these international um, airlines very quickly running to their national government. And there was no discussion of an international bailout um, for the aviation sector. There was no COVID operational recovery scheme in international aviation. Um, these were very clearly national actors. Um, and I think, you know, this is really open to people's eyes that um, there is no such thing as sort of an international sector which has international measures. And if these airlines, when times are bad, are running to their national capital, saying we are important national actors, we need national money. I think it's very difficult for them post-crisis to then go back to saying, oh, but actually when it comes to climate policy, we're international, state international solutions. They can't have it both ways. And I, you know, I'm never sitting through another conference again where I hear some industry tell me they're international, they need international solutions. Because that airline has money um, from a national government to bail them out, then it no longer have any credibility in expand. Yeah, I look forward to, to the trade disputes that are going to come over in the next few years. Boeing versus Airbus will be nothing. Yeah, um, I, that's all, all generally that I was going to discuss. Um, Paul, uh, do you have anything you'd like to come in on? Or yeah, maybe um, going back a little bit to uh, the uh, the way how to. Uh, introduce and create a market for those uh, alternative fuels and specifically the e-fuels. Um, for instance, in the Netherlands, there is now a, a proposal and that's more or less already confirmed. So it might indeed uh, become a reality that uh, by um, 2030, 14% of all fuel uh, bunkered in the Netherlands should be uh, an alternative fuel. And part of that should also be e-fuels majority biofuels but of course that can change uh, quite easily and quickly um, you see the same um, way of thinking in germany where uh, there is now for e-fuels only not for biofuels uh, uh, the idea to have a, a two percent in 2030 interestingly the german industry that's responsible for producing e-fuels they say we would rather see four percent or six percent that we can do it so why are you so unambitious to set it at 2%? Well, probably there is all sorts of uh, uh, political uh, constraints uh, with other sectors that might also use the same technology. But anyway, um, if you put in a, a mandate, then you do not need a tax because the cost is then automatically transferred to the aviation industry and in the end to the, the one who travels. Um, and the advantage of that is I think that it's a very direct way because you know the result. That's a, a certain given reduction of emissions. While if you tax maybe some clever big multi-international uh, company finds a way to, to avoid the tax instead of doing what you want. <laughs> and that's always, it's always an indirect way uh, of steering. Uh, and you have to uh, continuously uh, uh, change it because of the cost of uh, development in the industry. So if the, the fuel becomes a bit more ex, uh, expensive than expected, then your tax needs need immediately to rise to, to be successful. On the other hand, if it's the other way around, then the tax is too high and you get all sorts of uh, political problems. So my question is actually, would you support this idea that a mandate is preferable above a tax subsidy system? Or are there other objections or what are your thoughts about having those mandates, but then not only in the Netherlands and Germany? 
quick response from both of you, uh, Tim. So, I, 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 you know, I, 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 I suspect if we are serious about making inroads into this, that some form of blending mandates necessary. I suspect the reason there's a little bit of hesitation from environmental NGOs is you don't want to drive unsustainable production methods purely because you have a, a, a mandate to meet. So, you know, if, if you start taking the renewable energy that exists in the UK to make synthetic fuels, and then you deprive the other sectors of access to those renewables, then, you know, having a mandate could be counterproductive on an economy-wide basis. And um, same with biofuels. If we, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, the, the, the biofuels from, from waste, uh, which is something that, that many could support. But, you know, if, if, if they can't generate the volumes needed to make the blending mandates, then, then effectively you could get um, produced fuel suppliers looking for, for, for less sustainable uh, feedstocks. Um, so that's, that's the only reservation. It's got to be a realistic one. Um, you know, you could set a mandate based on a pathway to net zero. That, that would be a scientific approach. But say it has to be uh, a practical way of, of delivering that. Otherwise, you may find there are the perhaps unintended consequences. Andrew? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, it, it's a difficult conversation to talk about fuels because they're not an overnight solution. Um, they do need to be ramped up over time, and they're the solution to getting us to net zero by 2050. Um, but actually, building all these refineries, you know, even if you have a 2030 target, it's only nine years away. To develop a, a new industry for synthetic fuels, it's, it's not that easy. And we'd rather do it right than do it fast. And, and doing it right for synthetic fuels means a few different things. It means making sure the renewable electricity is additional, as Tim says. The pipe hydrogen you're using is actually made from renewables. You know stuff you really want to get right. So we should never look at fuels as the A solution because the climate today require an immediate production. We act two separate things. We need to cut aviation today. That's what taxation of airports. We need to put the sector on a path to long-term sustainability. That's fuels. They're, they're two very important things. But we, we should never use fuels to try and bring about the need emissions because that will cause. Thank you. Um, I was actually going to ask each of you for if you had any closing statement, but I think perhaps this, this is the time at which to, to bring in Harold and Harold can just talk about his conclusions and where we're going. Harold. I must say I've been left thoroughly depressed at the end of this. I see very little sign that the industry is going to move in any way quickly enough to address this and i don't think you're disagreeing but judging by your facial expressions so what do you think is going to happen in 20 say 2035 by which point it'd be crystal clear that the aviation industry has dragged its feet that other sectors have performed a lot better what happens to aviation then in 2035 if they don't start to move now of 15 years of the development of aviation is nothing, is it? It's round the corner, it's tomorrow. So what will happen to aviation if they haven't made a lot more progress by 2035? I'm, I'm, I'm not optimistic about what industry can do. And I don't expect, I don't expect industry to do anything. Um, no industry can unilaterally decarbonize all by itself. I think governments will do something. And I think governments will be far more interventionist in the next 15 years than have been the previous years. And I think there will be because there is ways for them to get involved in regular fuels. And as you say, other sectors will be doing more. And so the pressure will grow on aviation to do. I think we are making kind of a mistake when we, we somehow think that if, if, if we get the right CEO in charge of an airline, and if we get the right the environmental officer running Airbus, you know, things are going to be turned around. The, the, the absent leadership has always been from government. And I think instead of being slightly overwhelmed by, by the challenge of decarbonizing aviation. I think what we need to do is actually just be a bit, bit more casual about it. You know, aviation, every sector has its own difficulties in decarbonizing. You know, no sector is easy. I think we've realized that aviation is just like any other sector. It has challenges, it has its opportunities, 
uh, there's technologies that are available um, and approach it from that perspective and really put, put pressure on governments. So the, the pressure from governments, Tim, sorry Tim, just before you come in, that pressure from governments comes through what? Legislation and taxation? Yeah, nothing, Those nothing beats, instruments they have, aren't they? No, nothing beats laws on the books. You know, you can have all your papers, your conferences and everything, but nothing quite like a, a law that's backed up by jail terms and fines and, and bans and, and, and things like that. Or presumably, Tim, just removing slots. Well, removing slots or not providing capacity. So, you know, what's not happening is the plan transition, but that sort of ad hoc reaction uh, that that comes from the from the public is already influencing and causing disruption. And you know, I look at the UK in the last six months. We have a court of appeal that has torn up the government's plan for for Heathrow on the basis that it didn't take the Paris Agreement into account, that it didn't take non CO two into account. And we've had at the more local level two local authorities who have refused permission for Stansted Airport to expand this year and Bristol Airport to expand. Both those local authorities had declared local climate emergencies. They felt under pressure from, from, from their local populations and they cited climate change and not being able to clearly see what the industry or government's plan was to deal with it as one of the reasons why they refused it. And I suspect that's going to become more commonplace as well. So finally, are either of you optimistic? <laughs> I have. Uh, there's there's reasons to be optimistic. Uh, there's there's people who are working on this with solutions. There are people who are continuing to put pressure on government. I have been surprised at how a lot of governments have said the COVID recovery needs to be green. Uh, so you know, I you know, it's it's asking me a different time of the day. Um, there's certainly reasons to can be optimistic as well as the obvious reasons of present. Yeah, and, and I have a degree of optimism too. I mean, look at all the things that we've discussed. We have this more climate conscious public. Um, we have an industry that's borrowed a lot of money and governments should be thinking about reclaiming some of that money through more taxation. It changes the rationale. Um, we have got a lot more startups coming forward on the tech front. Uh, so maybe, you know, we don't have the big manufacturers, you know, they may be suspending or stopping some of their programs, but the startups are coming very much to the fore on sort of hydrogen fuel cell and, and, and electrification. So I think we have the component pieces. Um, as I say, if you, if you can get the accountability piece right, then hopefully it brings all of that together. So it is in the end going to be government regulation because that's the only way the airlines can be held. What worries me is, and you see the same thing in the hotel sector, there are still people building hotels which they assume will be making profits in 30 years time. And you have people building aircraft now, which I would have thought by 2050 will simply be illegal to operate because they are so polluting that nobody will permit them to be operating. So I don't understand the investment decisions that lie behind those kind of long-term investments into what would by, by then will be an antique and, and uh, disrupted industry but they're still doing it and that's why i'm pessimistic i wouldn't expect you to agree actually because given the work you do guys it's uh, it's perhaps inevitable that you can't agree with that i wish you every success in pushing the industry to change but i'm certainly more pessimistic i think than you are but thank you very much tim and, and andrew and thanks to paul and and chris as well for asking the questions this afternoon thank you very much indeed Thank you. Welcome.